Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Imran Velodia. Um, I'm the Dean of the uh, uh, Faculty Edwards. Um, I'd like to just um, I'd like to um, I'd like to just welcome you all to this evening. Um, we see part of the university's um, uh, mandate um, as us uh, kind of having to host a kind of important uh, 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 public events, which uh, uh, which kind of allows to share some of the university's expertise. Uh, to deal with with um, matters of um, um, uh, national interest, we've done quite a few of these, um, and the discussion tonight really uh, 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 focuses on the issue of on, of uh, kind of on the issue of auditing um, and its relationship to uh, kind of issues of state capture. Um, my sense is that in the state uh, uh, capture debate, we have uh, focused a lot um, on the role of uh, politicians in the massive looting that has happened. The part that we perhaps haven't paid enough attention to uh, is focusing on the institutions and the rules and the uh, uh, governance systems and the checks and uh, 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 balances that uh, kind of really ought to have been in place uh, to uh, kind of ensure that we don't have the abuse uh, the, 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 that we've had. So here I'm, I'm, I'm sort of talking about the lawyers, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, kind of private sector institutions, uh, many of our uh, uh, kind of other uh, governance systems uh, that really should have ensured that w w what happened didn't happen. Uh, the fact that it that it did happen, I think, is highlighted um, kind of in the open secrets report uh, that, that's called that's called uh, that's called that's called that's called the. Uh, Kind of enablers, um, and if you if you've not yet seen the report, I would urge you to read it. Um, and we're really uh, kind of pleased to have Open Secrets with us here tonight. Um, we also thrilled uh, to 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 partner to uh, uh, partner to uh, partner tonight with Ray Matlaka, who you've all heard. Uh, 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 Kind of, uh, kind of on the radio sharing with us important uh, 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 business news. Uh, kind of, Ray, you brought such a refreshing uh, 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 tone and insight into the business reports that you do uh, that we're really, really pleased to have you. We have lots of folk to thank for um, um, making tonight uh, uh, possible. Uh, there's all of the, uh, there's all of the speakers. Uh, there's all of the IT folk that 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 kind of help us to to um, make um, make this happen. There's the team from my office, including Kim, who who um, 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 make sure that we can organize it all. Uh, but I really want to just tonight highlight the role of of the. the Tolawana, uh, 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 who really organized the whole e uh, the uh, kind of whole evening tonight. So uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Tolawana. For those who, uh, for those of you who are tweeting, uh, please use use the hashtag stay uh, capture. Um, Come and please, please tag adverts uh, uh, CLM, uh, and and we we can also make sure in that way to uh, kind of keep you updated on all uh, kind of events that we organise. Please feel free to post any questions on the uh, kind of on on the chat section. 
and I'm sure Ray will 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 kind of try to accommodate as much of that as he can. So I think I've said enough. Let me then pass it on to Ray. Over to you then, Ray. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for the kind words. Um, hello, everybody. It's lovely to be with you this early evening. Uh, we want to have an honest and maybe uncomfortable discussion about South Africa's auditing industry. It wasn't long ago that uh, auditing standards in South Africa were regarded as the world's best. As recently as 2016, uh, the World Bank ranked our auditing standards as number one worldwide. But in recent years, we have lost our number one spot. And it is no surprise, uh, given the series of scandals hanging over the profession, uh, just think of the crisis at Steinhoff, African Bank, VBS Mutual Bank, Tonga Hewlett, EOH, and so many other cases that don't grab media headlines. Also, the audit profession was a key enabler of state capture. I think we can all agree on this. Um, audit failures do not only impact investors who rely on the opinion of auditors to make investment decisions, but audit failures can also result in the collapse of companies, including the livelihoods of people, as we have seen in the looting of VBS Mutual Bank. So how did the auditing industry find itself on the wrong side of governance requirements? What exact role did the profession play in aiding and abetting state capture? And how can the industry be reformed so that past failures don't happen again? We will be answering these questions with our rock star panel uh, this evening. Uh, we have Nirupa Padia. She is the head of WITS uh, School of Accountancy. She is uh, close to nurturing and developing talent and the future generation of accountants as well. So uh, Nirupa, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Then we have Michael Marchant. He is the head of investigations at Open Secrets. You should know about Open Secrets by now because uh, it is a nonprofit organization that is at the forefront of exposing high level corruption and economic crimes as well. We also have Nankululeka Kabado. She is a chartered accountant and celebrated entrepreneur who is an auditing, well, who started an auditing and an advisory uh, practice uh, during the height of a birth date. Uh, she was also recently part of the caretaker board at Urba, which is a watchdog for the auditing profession. Now we are supposed to have Mr. Freeman Mvalo from Saika, uh, but unfortunately he's not available uh, to join us, um, but that's not a problem. We soldier on uh, with our pan panel this, uh, this uh, afternoon. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome all. And to you, the audience, uh, I'm told there are many profession professionals in the auditing uh, industry joining us this, uh, this early evening. So please uh, engage, with, engage with us and uh, let's make this discussion as uh, interactive as possible. Now, each of our panelists will be making short remarks before we start our discussion. Uh, and we will start with Nirupa. Nirupa, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ray. So good evening to all the panelists, our Dean, and of course, to all the viewers. So I've been obviously put in what I'm going to call the hot seat in the light of the fact that it's like, but you train the accountant. So what really are you doing? Because why are we where we are? So I want to start by actually saying, you know, right up front when we training and teaching. So I've been at WITS for over 20 years and I taught auditing, auditing for over 12 years. So then of course the question in my own mind is, is this what we produced? Okay, when you hear about scandals. And I think I wanna start by saying that in the first lecture, the first point we make is when you become a CA or an accountant or an auditor, you are not just representing yourself, you are representing the profession. So right now, unfortunately, if you had to ask me, I'm a CA 
am I now also part of this whole state capture? So are auditors completely not involved? No. Are all the auditors involved in the state capture? Definitely not. So I must tell you that I can put my head on the block that there's many professionals here tonight that are not to be defensive, but to say, hey guys, don't paint the same brush on all of us. So I wanna start making a few comments. The first thing is that when we teach, right? There's the basic framework. So some in the audience may know about the international standards, some others may not know. But be that as it may, the main standards, which one would think when they're doing an audit, that would be applied is understanding your client, planning the audit. What are the risks? How do you respond to the risks? And there's a whole thing that goes on. So the question then becomes, did this happen? If it did, how did things go wrong? If it did not happen, why did it not happen? Is it because somebody, be it a an audit firm, be it an entrepreneur, profit motive reason as one example, that actually due to deadlines of time, due to deadlines of budget, we fast tracked everything we needed to do. We think we did a decent job, but something went wrong. Is that possible? Another point would be, we always talk about audit quality. Was the quality what we would have expected? And if yes, again, then what happened? And if no, that means we did not do what we were assigned to do. And there's a whole ecosystem here. So as the Dean mentioned, you know, it's the auditors, it's the lawyers, it's the bankers, um, it's the audit committees, it's the people who are negotiating fees for auditors, a whole lot of things going on in the background. So for me, the the point I want to make first is as a theory person that teaches this, can I say with a clear conscience, we teach these kids the right thing? The answer is definitely yes. So then what are the next steps? So the next point that I want to make is we always talk about leadership and we talk about ethical leadership. And the words commonly used is the tone at the top. So if somebody way down is either making errors or doing something they shouldn't do, what is the repercussion of this? What is the consequence if you're not following what this audit quality is or what you are meant to do? So there when we talk about ethical leadership, the tone is set at the top. So then is it possible that somebody may have gotten be it power hungry, be it money hungry, and actually turned a bit of a blind eye because you think that in auditing, definitely materiality is a very common concept. So you're not checking everything. You're checking your big ticket items, your material items. So then in my own head, the question arises, if these were all immaterial transactions and we got away with it, one can understand. But when we're looking at the state capture, these are really big numbers. So then the question is, how does such big numbers go through without something being picked up? And the other point is that when we do an audit, the risk is not that you're going to say something is wrong when it's right. Because if it's right, it's right. You're not going to be able to show that it's wrong. The risk is when something is wrong, but your report or your processes or procedures appeared that it was all right. So on some level, I'm talking about how we train correctly, we train properly, and what is going wrong? Is it in the profession? So without defending the pro profession, what I do want to say is that if somebody has been fraudulent, if somebody has been so underhanded, 
that if you followed everything, you wouldn't pick it up. Then you wouldn't pick it up. So then is that the auditor's fault? Then not necessarily, right? But there's things like professional skepticism. Are you really applying your mind to say, does this look kosher? Is there a problem here? There's words like ethical leadership that are already mentioned. And then things like what happened after the audit, subsequent events. What are your going concern risks? Is this going to continue as a business, et cetera, et cetera. So related parties, what really are the interrelationships, conflict of interest, independence, the list can just go on. So if you ask me, do I have the answer? No. But if you ask me, do we do what we are meant to do? I can certainly say yes. But we cannot control the ethics once people are then in the profession for whatever reason that might be. The one other point that I want to make is around the societal aspect. So again, talking to auditing 101, who do we serve? We serve the public. We serve the public interest. So somewhere along the line, if that gets lost, that leads to trust getting lost. So that is where we are right now. Do people trust us as auditors? Probably not, right? So then once you've lo lost trust or reputation, it's like any relationship. Once that is broken, it's really hard work to get it back on track. So then the next real big question is, are we looking after society or are we looking after self-interest? And if you look particularly at state-owned entities, then that is where the public interest really lies. You know, it's all our tax money that's used for these. So I think I'm actually going to stop there because there's the other panelists that's going to speak. But the two points that I want to end with is I was also on the Urba board from June 2020, July 2020 to January, and then Nom Koluleko took over there. And there you would also say, you know, what are the processes to be able for the regulator to hold people accountable? Are maybe the, if I can use the word punishment, not severe enough? So if I use an example of skipping a red robot, you know, if I need to pay a 300 rand fine, am I still going to do it anyway? Or am I not going to do it? And then the last point around ethics is the point I always use in my classes as well, is will you do the same thing if nobody is watching? And for me, that's really the heart of ethics, that whether somebody is watching over your shoulder or not, you will still do the same thing. And then my last point is, of course, what are we then doing to train better auditors? You know, And of course, Freeman is not here, which he was meant to be. He would have probably spoken a bit about the psycho competency 2025 framework, the teaching that's changing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I want to end by saying that we're doing our best and it's not every auditor in this country or the world that's tainted. But unfortunately, it's sad for even somebody like me to sit here this evening. I won't say to defend, but to say, no, there's something that needs to be fixed. But there's also a lot that actually still operates within the profession, which unfortunately we're not going to look at because the, the iron is hot on this particular topic. So let me stop there, Ray. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Nirupa. I think for me, the takeaway is that not all apples are bad in the industry. There are some good people out there. Uh, just a reminder, can you, you can uh, send through your comments in the comment box. Um, it's located around either your left or right side, depending on which you know, angle you're viewing giving us this evening. Um, but up next is Nankululeko. Can you share some thoughts, please? Hi, everyone. Um, 
uh, I suppose as an auditor, uh, this whole topic is about me as well. Uh, you know, uh, whenever the media wants me to comment, I always say, well, I'm one of them. You know, <laughs> they're talking about me as well. Anyway, I, I suppose it's, it's an important debate to have. I just want to say, you know, that we cannot put the, the, the big portion of the blame on auditors because they are the last people to arrive, right? And, and, and therefore, let's put the lion's share of the blame on political leaders, government leaders, leaders of institutions, who are the real ones who enabled state capture. And, and for me, it's actually very sad when leaders do not do their job, you know, such that we can have the kind of failures that we've seen of institutions. And we must be grateful to the State Capture Commission for revealing the depth of the problem. Because I think we all knew there was corruption, but we didn't know the depth. And, and now we cannot bear our heads under the sand and pretend as if we don't know. Now we, we do know. And we do have to hold everybody accountable. Yes, the auditors must be held accountable, but let's hold as citizens of South Africa, the, the leaders who led us uh, down this rapid hole. Because there is no country that can depend on auditors for a systemic problem of corruption such as we've had in South Africa. So, so, so I just want to put that record straight that uh, let, let, let's put the blame at the door where uh, it is well deserved. And I want to put the blame also on our uh, opposition parties. Because for me, the big role of opposition parties is to make sure that we don't end up with a rogue state <laughs> like we have today. Yes, we have to acknowledge the fact that we are here today with all these exposures because they, they stood up. But I would want to see us preventing these things from happening rather than, you know, uh, then be told what happened after everything has happened. So we, we want the opposition parties to play their role also, you know, in, in putting our country back on track. And for me, this whole state capture thing and this corruption problem that we have in the country is really sad because uh, the, the result of it is the impact that it has on our institutions, the impact it has on the poor. I mean, if you can remember just those old people who are queuing there at VPS for their money, I mean, that is really just heartbreaking. So, so uh, the, the impact on the economy, this is a serious problem that needs to be attended to. So coming back to the, to the fact that the auditors are the last ones to arrive. That's why we have accounting standards, we have auditing standards, we have government governance frameworks like the, the King Four. So we need to work really hard to make sure that we strengthen those first line of defense in terms of our combined assurance model. Uh, the, the boards of these institutions, they need to be strengthened. The, the audit committees, we've got to appoint the right executive leadership, like the CEOs, the CFOs, the, the internal auditors, because those are the people really who can defend these institutions before the auditors even arrive on the scene. And we, we, we unfortunately also have to hold uh, auditors accountable because they did enable state capture. And yes, you know, it's not the majority of, of auditors who, who did that. Uh, again, uh, you know, there are those who were not necessarily involved, but who did pick up these things, which means that there are failures in our processes and our systems uh, in these auditing firms. And that has to be acknowledged. 
But the, the, the other problem we have to acknowledge is that auditors also got involved in this pursuit of riches. And when we are pursuing riches, unfortunately, the, the result is that there will be, a, a, our ethics will break down, which is what happened. And the result is also the breakdown in the processes and systems, because when we're chasing profits, when we're chasing um, bonuses, you know, we're going to overlook certain things and not focus on the things that we need to focus on. I mean, the first responsibility of auditors is to make sure that they provide a good service and they offer a good quality audits so that we don't end up with the audit failures that we've seen. So, so, um, so what do we do then? For me, the, the, the past is the past, you know, there's nothing we can do about the past. It is what it is. Now that we know the depth of this rot, what are we going to do about it? I was listening to the president. He was assuring us that, uh, you know, something is being done to put things right, but it's going to take strong, effective leadership for, for us to put the country back on track. And we've got to hold all these leaders, you know, accountable to make sure that happens as citizens because the country is suffering, uh, people are suffering. Even th these riots for me are just proof of, you know, the, the, the suffering that is out there. I mean, we cannot be allowing the resources of the country to be wasted like we've seen uh, with the state capture. So now let's, let, let's fold our, our shirts and get to work, you know, clean up the place and, and make sure that we get everything back on track. And so leaders, for me, have to do their job. And we want the regulators to work together. Erba and Saika have to work together to put things right. We cannot afford silo mentality at such a time as this. And Erba, yes, they have to do their job of, of being a watchdog. They've been strengthened with the new audit act, but they are being criticized by not taking a part in in, in strengthening their own members. So they've got to find a way of balancing the act between the watchdog and, and, and improving their own members because they can't turn a blind eye on the fact that it is their members who are failing. And, 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 and yes, we can punish them after the fact, but we want to prevent these things from happening. So leaders for me must do their job. When they don't do their job, the, 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 the cost of poor leadership is very high. I've always been complaining as to why are we not able to put things right in terms of our institutions. And, uh, and, and so when the Minister of Finance appointed us at ERPA, I was very clear in my mind that I'm there to do a job. He gave me three months to do it, and I was going to do it within that three months. Within weeks, we, we were able to stabilize that place, and we made sure that there is a competent board to take over. So leaders, please, let's do our jobs. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Nongulego. Uh, again, the takeaway from me is that it took a network of individuals to make, uh, and players, by the way, a network of, of players to make state capture possible and also repurpose uh, institutions of accountability as well. And we'll talk later about the role of URBA and whether its sanctions are, are, are enough to deter bad behavior. Uh, Michael, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Ray. Um, and thank you again to, to Vitz for hosting us and for having this discussion. We were, we were just uh, chatting amongst the panel before we started and saying that, you know, a few years ago, we are not sure whether hundreds of people would respond to a public event about auditing. And I think it's so encouraging that, I mean, despite the fact that we are picking through these, these cases of grand corruption, which are deeply troubling, um, that it has started, I think, very important and overdue conversations around the role of professional enablers, uh, bankers, lawyers, auditors, and others in these systems. And, and I think that, that that in and of itself is an important place to start. What I wanted to do today, and, and Nirupa, you actually set this up really well, because I think the question you are asking is this question of if we are producing skilled accountants and auditors at our universities and we're sending them out into the profession, 
and they are able to do all the things technically that we're asking them to do, what is happening between then and when they're entering some of these firms and the work that they're doing that leads us to see some of these failures? And what I wanted to do was just present from the open secrets perspective, what we see as some of the key problems that are leading to these systemic failures and the role of auditors, not only in state ca capture at uh, public entities, but also in very significant audit failure at private entities. And Ray, you mentioned those at the, at the outset here. We're talking about um, Deloitte's role at places like Steinhoff and Tonga Hewlett and a range of other massive corporate frauds that have fallen away. So I want to look at what I think some of the issues are. And in fact, many people have already been raising these in the chat box. And I think I'll be reiterating quite a few views that have already been said. And then I just want to discuss a few uh, ideas about where the conversation could move in terms of reform and what, what we could do about these things. Um, and then I, you know, hopefully that can open up the discussion. But I think to, to start off with, I think that where the two panelists before are absolutely uh, correct is that it's the notion that it is, I suppose, not all auditors, if we can say that. But I think what we need to add to that is it's also not a uniquely South African problem. I think that audit around the globe is facing a, a real reckoning. And there, there are efforts in, in many countries, including the United Kingdom notably, that is realized that there needs to be absolutely wholesale reform, not only of the way that audit firms are structured, but of the way that we regulate them. Because up until now, they have largely been able to act as a law unto themselves, and they have not been, uh, they've not kind of come under adequate uh, regulation. And so I do think that that is an important recognition that we are part of a global system that is not working from a financial perspective. And, and we can also learn from what others are doing in terms of how to address um, some of these issues. But I think what the idea of the not all auditors uh, problem leads us uh, towards is the fact that we then need to look at the systemic structural problems, particularly within the big four audit firms to really understand where the issues lie. And I think what we have to now acknowledge is that auditors no longer go from universities into a sm generally a small audit firm where they become a professional auditor. What they do is they go into what have become some of the largest corporations in the world that have sprawling hundreds of offices, hundreds of thousands of employees and businesses at PwC, EY, KPMG and Deloitte that are now predominantly geared towards consulting and advisory and who have to balance those profit motives with their audit work. And I, I think this is the first thing that I want to flag is that we need to have a discussion about whether there's now a fundamental conflict of interest in allowing firms that are that big to continue operating in the way um, that they are. And we see this in many different places. Um, if we look at the role of Deloitte, for example, and the way that they were implicated uh, in uh, work at, at ESCOM at the heights of state capture, and I know that Deloitte and ESCOM eventually settled that matter, we saw Deloitte very aggressively pursuing advisory fees in ESCOM's work. And we've seen this at the big four firms across the state, is that they are actively going out and looking for consulting work because it is so lucrative. And this goes back to the point that Nonkululeko made, is that if we have auditors who are kowtowing to the board in order to secure future or present lucrative fees in various ways from other work, uh, non-audit work, it is often inevitable that the audit work is going to suffer. Um, and I, I think addressing that conflict of interest um, and, the, and the lack of independence, I think, of auditors uh, is very important. And that also goes towards protecting critical auditors from boards um, and also having the firms that they work for uh, back them up when they want to point out um, something that's wrong. And, and that leads me to the second point that I wanted to raise, which is that I think that the big four audit firms in particular need to really do a lot of introspection around the culture within the firms and what, how they treat young auditors who do blow the whistle and who do seek to point out problems that they, that they find. And I think a powerful example of this is the case of KPMG's work at VBS. So we know now that the senior audit partner at KPMG who worked at VBS has been indicted. And so he's been criminally charged and is in the dark for, for allegedly being a party to the fraud. 
Um, and obviously, KPMG might now say, well, if an auditor decides to do that, uh, you know, it wasn't us, what can we do? But the story beneath that is that the junior auditor at KPMG immediately identified what was wrong at VBS because it was a very glaring issue. VBS were reporting cash reserves when they didn't have money in the bank. And the junior auditor doing the first thing that an auditor does, which is to reconcile the bank statements, realized that there was a glaring hole there. And I think what we're not asking enough of is, is when that auditor went back to their team at KPMG, they've since said that they felt that there was no one there who would protect them if they were to bring that issue to the firm. So their, um, the audit partner, they obviously felt was compromised, but they also didn't feel that there were, there were any structures there um, or at the regulator to protect them. And that's a problem we've seen across the board in state captures, the, the failure to protect whistleblowers. But we've seen it uh, across the globe uh, with big four audit firms. I'm, I'm thinking also around uh, the stories about EY and their global operations. And EY has been accused of icing out and threatening whistleblowers who blow the whistle on the problem. And that's deeply troubling because if we are producing auditors, as Nirupa says, who, and we're teaching them, you are auditing in the public interest and you have a professional responsibility to point out problems but they are then working within a structure and within a culture that discourages them from doing that. It's very difficult to, to, to you know, to build an, an ethical industry, I think, based on that, uh, you know, based on that. The, the final, I suppose, problem that I wanted to point out, and this, um, I think, has been mentioned already several times, and it's particularly a problem, I think, in the South African context, is that the punitive measures and consequences for auditors who are found to have made very serious violations are, we believe, clearly inadequate. So up until very recently, uh, and I know Nonkululika and Nirupa, you will know this, having worked at Erba, the IRBA had the option of a maximum of 200,000 rand uh, fine uh, per charge that an auditor was found, was found guilty of. And I think what we, have, uh, what we have found and reported on is if you look at the South African Airways case study, which Open Secrets published recently on, you have PwC that earned anywhere between 70 and 90 million rand in fees from SAA over a number of years and settled with the IOBA by consent order that they routinely and systemically failed that audit for four years in a row in very serious ways, uh, failing um, you know, to identify uh, violations of the PFMA and not reporting irregular expenditure, but also very serious failures around the SAA's complete um, you know, absence of controls and reporting on their assets and things like that. But if you earn nearly 100 million rand in fees over that time, and yet at the end of the day, you might have to pay a, a few hundred thousand rand uh, fine, and your name might not even be published in the Urba report, you know, at that point, you really start to say, well, that's not a disincentive. And for these firms, fines of that magnitude become a cost of doing business. They really can write them off and move forward. And we have not really seen uh, much accountability for those auditors who are uh, caught out. And we've often seen the big four firms in particular um, defending those people. It's very rare that we've seen people fired um, or resigning. And so I think if you take those, those things together, those systemic problems within the industry, within the firms, with the problems with regulation. I think that that explains kind of a great deal um, to do with our problems. Uh, just to maybe just put a few ideas out there, I think all of these match, um, you know, the potential solutions, they match what I've raised here about the problems. You know, what the UK is, is really having a heated debate about at the moment is the extent to which we need to have a discussion around the full structural separation of audit from non-audit non work in the big four firms. And I, I know that this is something that uh, the big four firms bulk at and really push back against. And there are implications that have to be thought through around profitability and, and what that means about audit quality. But we can, I don't think we can any longer ignore the conflict of interests that consulting and auditing within the same firm's causes. I think we, we see it come up time and time again. I think that ensuring greater independence um, and greater teeth for the regulators is absolutely essential. 
And I did want to flag that there are green shoots here. The Auditing Profession Amendment Act, which was passed earlier this year, does give uh, the ERBA greater powers, for example, of search and seizure. Uh, there'll no longer be that, that limit on fines, which will be crucial. And there'll also be greater non-auditor representation on the board, which also maybe will go some way uh, towards establishing um, independence. Um, and, and linked to that is obviously genuine accountability for auditors who are, who are found to have engaged in malfeasance. And then the final thing, which is, is something that is always a tension with auditing, is, is I think we need to discuss strengthening the responsibility and the procedures for auditors to detect fraud. And so it, it's often a, a, a thing that auditors come back to, to say it's not our job to detect fraud, right? And it's not the primary job. I think what Nurup has already said is, is crucial in this regard, is that it, it is your job to be professionally skeptical. And most of the stories we've seen in state capture, places like SAA and otherwise, it would not have taken more than a critical mindset and a proper questioning order to, to identify what was going on. And I think arguably the same is, is true for many of the large corporate frauds at places uh, like Tonga Hewlett. And so... I think that an, a sufficiently skeptical auditor would have identified those problems. But I do think that we are now realizing that the public increasingly has a greater expectation for audit. And we need to discuss how to align that with actual responsibilities for auditors uh, to, to do more to detect fraud and therefore to report on that uh, and to report the procedures that they've gone through. Um, and I know that this is also a discussion happening in, in you know, for audit context uh, around the world. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's my input for now and hopefully it, it stimulates the conversation. Yeah, so many points uh, to talk about there, Michael. And perhaps can I just stick with you and start with you, Michael. Uh, you co-authored uh, an open secrets report last year, uh, which details how auditing firms made corruption possible at VBS Mutual Bank, SAA, uh, just to name the few, just to name a few. And, and by the way, that report, a link to the report is available in the comments section if you want to read it. I implore you to read it. Uh, do you think auditing firms have fully come clean about their role in state capture? I ask this question because to my knowledge, none of the big four auditing firms have explicitly stated that they have uh, aided and abetted state capture I mean, they use terms such as uh, missing red flags or lapses in audit standards. And my favorite, accounting irregularity. Have audit firms admitted the full extent of their role in state capture in your view? The simple answer from me is no. I, d I don't think that they have. And I, I think that the reason that they haven't is that there has been insufficient scrutiny in general by both law enforcement, regulatory authorities, and to be honest, the Zondo Commission of the role of these actors. And I, I'll give you a good example. I think that one of the most powerful moments of the Zondo Commission from an auditing perspective was when uh, Pule Motibe from PwC was, was put on the stand and, and cross-examined by the evidence leaders about PwC's work at SAA. And why that was so powerful is that you could get the senior auditor in charge of the project on the stand and say, what did you know? And can you explain to us when you knew it and why you didn't report it? And in that instance, what we have is we had Motiba by the end having to admit that yes, PwC had identified the fact that SAA were not properly reporting irregular expenditure and that they were therefore not compliant with the PFMA and therefore that that should have been reported. However, they didn't include it in the financial statements. And at that point, to be fair, he couldn't properly explain how an auditor at that point would not include that in the report. And so we have a, a, a greater understanding of what went wrong there. Um, however, beyond that, PwC have still not admitted that there was any kind of ethical failure in that conduct. And because none of the other firms have really properly been grilled in that kind of situation, I don't think that we've had them come under sufficient pressure uh, in order to do that. And I think what we often do see, which is quite disappointing, is 
a desire to ignore those things that have happened and rather look forward in the sense that all the audit firms are now saying we have now started a process of doing transparency reports, for example, and every year we'll release something that looks at our, our controls. But I think what the public desires uh, very correctly is, uh, is a reckoning and an accounting. Um, and, and part of that would also include questions of when they're going to be paying back the money. Some of the firms have done that in some instances, but many haven't. And I think it's a legitimate expectation uh, where the audit failure is, is very serious and obvious that that should be part of the discussion. Mm. Nungulago, Michael raises quite uh, an important point there. How can we move forward and how can we start embracing reforms if we don't have, you know, full honesty from, um, you know, audit firms? But a very fascinating trend has emerged. When auditing companies have been accused of wrongdoing, their defense is largely twofold. You know, auditing firms will say we rely on the honesty of our corporate clients to be honest with us. So they sort of leave it to their clients to volunteer information and be honest. Um, and they also say that their job is to normally not to detect fraud. Nukulaga, is that defense from audit firms fair or are they simply passing down the buck of accountability, basically? Yeah, I suppose those are difficult debates. The issue of fraud, uh, of detecting fraud, is one of those that we we need to face, and 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 I do understand why uh, it it is difficult for auditors to take up that responsibility because first of all, as I said, they get there last, and and they cannot audit you know every transaction of the organization. Right, they have to take a sample of. Of, of, of transactions. So, I mean, if you take a sample, you, you sort of sense a trend and, and, and so on, and it is possible to miss some of these, of, of these uh, mistakes or, or in, intentional fraudulent transactions in that regard. But we, we do need to address th that issue because uh, I suppose we, we do have to bring in forensic auditing as part of the assurance process so that we can have people who are skilled because truly uh, they are not trained forensic auditors. You know, forensic auditing is different from the normal external audit. So uh, we, we do need to think about bringing forensic auditors, auditing, sorry, as part of the assurance. If, even if it's just to do that, that initial assessment to just see those red flags that normal auditors maybe would would um, would uh, not 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 detect, but I mean, of course, for me, the the first step of of repair is to acknowledge that you were wrong, and it becomes difficult for auditors, as opposed to openly acknowledge that they were wrong, because uh, repercussions of that and, and being sued and, 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 and all of those responsibilities uh, come into play. So, so it, that's, that's why it's difficult, but until you acknowledge that you've been wrong, how committed are you going to be in putting things right? If, if you are putting defenses up front, I mean, when I'm dealing with somebody and they start by being defensive, I just give up at that point. Because I know that if you are defensive, first of all, you're not open to changing. You know, as a leader, I just know that in dealing you, with you is going to be difficult. So auditors, you know, I hope in private, amongst themselves now in the firm, they do come back and have open discussions around these things. Because when you look at these audit failures, really, I cannot believe that, take, just take SAA. I cannot believe that a whole institution can be totally destroyed and you didn't know. I mean, surely as an auditor, even if you come at the end, surely you have known. So um, yes, there are reforms that are needed, major reforms that are needed. And I always say to auditors, you know, start regulating yourself before regulators come in because you will not like it. 
you know, you, you will really not like it. But again, is this profit thing? That's why we don't even want to separate. Separate. I don't know. You know all the the the, the deep answers to separating consulting and, and auditing, but that is the main reason. Is that I mean they are going to lose that they are so used to these riches, these auditors, that it's difficult for them to let go of all these things. So regulators now will have to come in and make these decisions on their behalf. Thanks. Mm. And I speak under correction, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of the auditing uh, firms make more money from consulting services than, than auditing, uh, Michael, if, if, if I'm correct, I think. Um, but Nirupa, let me bring you in here. Uh, you know, you talked about grooming and nurturing the next generation of um, auditors, accounting professionals. Um, at a university level, um, how fit for purpose is the curriculum post state capture and now understanding the role of uh, auditors and state capture. I, I mean, has the program been reformed to beef up on ethics? I mean, you can throw the ethics book, I guess, at somebody, but at the end of the day, you are leaving it up to them to, to, to you know, to assess uh, various situations and whether they will make the right decision. But is there any re reform, uh, you know, at a university curriculum level uh, in the wake of uh, what we've seen with, uh, you know, the role of auditors and state capture? Um, thanks, Ray. Yes, definitely. I mean, I mentioned earlier that Freeman is not here. SICA has put out a SICA 2025 competency framework, but even without that, you know, obviously we from the university have to constantly reform what we're teaching and how we're teaching. But I think the ethics and the leadership are for us the two things where we think things have been failing, right? Because as Nomkululeko said, if the leader is not ethical and people cannot whistle blow because they're not going to get any protection, in fact, they may get punished, then that's not going to work. So the ethics certainly, certainly is like within everything that we do. And I said earlier that we can't hold somebody accountable for their ethics. However, I think as Michael alluded to earlier, and also in a way Norm Koluleko said this as well, that if the auditing profession is really the big four right now in, in you know, that make up the chunk of the profession, so to speak. So even if the four firms get together and say what next in terms of this, so we can do curriculum reform, we can prepare our students even better. So I'm not gonna say every student of ours is perfect. No, they barely get 50% to get out into the firm, you know? But what I will say is that what definitely has been happening, Ray, is there's this thing where you put your head down, you, you do what you're told to do when you get into the firm and you keep moving along. And I think I know coming from WITS, we usually sort of challenge our students, you know, to be critical thinkers, to ask the difficult questions. And I know once in a conversation, I was told that actually we don't really like to take with students because they ask too many questions. We actually want people who can just, you know, get on with the job and, and sort of do the procedures and move along. And that's not at all what we want in the current times. And I think, Ray, for me, the big thing is, based on what even Nomkululeko raised, is for the profession to realize that there is a problem. We need to fix it. Being defensive is not the answer. Paying back, admitting, doing what's needed to fix it has to come through. In the same time, I have to say, I'm not particularly the political type of person, so to speak, you know, but obviously our country and the politicians need to play the role. They are reflection of our society. So we can fix the profession all we want, but if that's not going to fix, we're still not going to get it right as a country at large. And also when Michael said earlier that UK is really looking at things, I think as a country, it may also be time for us to say particularly when it comes to state-owned entities, should we have certain, you know, almost delegation of authority to say, you will do this, you will do this, so that it's almost alleviating 
that profit motive or conflict of interest and independence motive. Thanks, Rick. Fascinating. Uh, Michael, uh, there's a lot of, there's a theme emerging in the comments section about uh, internal versus external auditing. Uh, a lot of people feel that uh, the blame is largely placed on external auditors, but internal auditors, you know, sort of, you know, escape accountability, uh, you know, but, but how big of a responsibility do internal auditors have? And we should, should we focus more on internal auditors? Because my understanding is that external auditors rely on the work of internal auditors in, in order to, to be able to carry their work. So are internal auditors, you know, escaping when it comes to accountability? I certainly think that they are perhaps uh, sliding under the radar, flying under the radar to a certain extent. And I, I think that it's inevitable um, just in the sense that it is, it's the external auditor who ultimately is telling you as the state and the public and the shareholder, everything's okay. And so when everything isn't okay, it's inevitable that the first port of call is the external auditor. Um, also in the sense that when the external audit, the external auditor is always going to be that outside independent firm and is going to be making a great deal of money out of it. And I think that's another source of the focus on the external auditors. But what I think is a better, how I think is a better way to look at it is that we should start looking at them, uh, start looking at internal and external auditors in the same breath a lot more than we currently do. So rather than saying we need to focus on one a little bit more than the other, it's to scrutinize that issue, first of all, of the conduct of internal auditors and where, um, where that's inadequate and where their own professional bodies, such as the Institute for Internal Auditors, has been insufficient in addressing some of those, some of those problems. Um, but the other aspect that we have to then uh, address is what external auditors are doing when they see glaring deficiencies in the in internal audit function because often those are deeply linked. And, and I go back to this example again, but South African Airways is a good example of this, is that PwC, one of the things that they've been found guilty of in, under the URBA charge sheet is for saying that, the, that they had spotted nothing wrong with the internal audit function, when in fact, as soon as the Auditor General took up the audit, they said, well, there are glaring deficiencies here. And that's something that uh, the external auditors should have been aware of. They were sitting in on the audit committee meetings where those issues were raised. Um, and so I, I certainly think so. And, you know, th that again, I suppose, goes to the inherently linked nature uh, of these things. And Nonkululeko's point uh, she was making earlier around the boards, it's the same thing. And I, I, I suppose I agree and disagree with it. I agree because we have to look at the responsibilities of directors, that they have fiduciary duties and legal duties that they've been fundamentally violating. And it's the same for internal auditors. Where I differ is that I think that in most cases, when we look at state capture and gross fraud, the external auditors are perfectly positioned to warn the public the state as the shareholder and private shareholders that it's happening and they're failing to do so. Um, and they can, they can point out those deficiencies for much earlier. And I think that they can contribute to a process that can nip those problems in the bud so that we don't find ourselves in the situation of SAA where is essentially we're relying on the auditor general to tell us that this entity can no longer be rescued. It's an absolute financial mess. And yet it's had five years in a row with, with a clean audit and not a single uh, remark. Yeah. Fascinating. And Nunku Lega, let's bring you in here. Uh, maybe in looking forward and reforming, uh, you know, the, 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 the auditing industry, shouldn't we look at the mandate of uh, auditors, whether it be internal or external um, auditors? Should auditors have a public interest mandate, one that places the interest of the public first over you know, the clients of audit, auditing firms. I ask this because um, in, in the VBS case, I think it was quite a watershed moment for the auditing industry. Um, a bank was looted, public funds went missing, people lost their monies. So I go back to my question. Shouldn't we, in, in looking forward, shouldn't we 
uh, look at the mandate of auditors as, a, as one that um, has the public's uh, interest at, at heart um, over clients? Yeah, the, these things are actually complex because mm. auditors uh, individually are registered with ERBA, the institution that is responsible to look after that public interest. So, so in a sense, the, the individual registered auditor is accountable to, to the ERBA for their conduct. Um, and, and you may find that when an investigation is being done, what is being investigated is the, is the registered auditor, right? So that public interest responsibility really lies with the ERPA, who are supposed to then hold these auditors accountable. This is why I was saying they can't put their head uh, under the sand around their own members, because yes, you are the watchdog and, and you're looking after public interest, but these are your members that are committing these, these acts that are putting institutions in, in such danger. So, 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 so I think this is how government thinks they're taking care of the public interest part. But, um, but again, obviously the, the auditing firm itself is responsible for their own processes, their systems and their people. You know, um, and, and we, we must say that, unfortunately, the culture within these auditing firms has been shocking in, in, in the sense that they've not created a culture of openness where these things can be reported. Because again, because of that pro pro profit motive, right? So if, if you know that if you report the, the, the engagement partner who is complicit in all of these acts, you know, people are afraid to lose their jobs and, and they know that they will not be protected. And we've seen how whistleblowers really have been persecuted, unfortunately. So, so that's why we have to strengthen all of these institutions, both the state institutions and, and the, the auditing profession uh, and SICA and all of those people. Because I mean, again, the, the, most of these, the, the CFOs in these institutions, most of them are CAs. So SICA has to say, how are you making sure that your, your, your members do their job, right? And, 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 and hold then these, these accounting firms accountable for, 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 for their actions. It, it, guys, what we need is a cleanup of the whole system. That's why just focusing on the auditing profession alone is not going to help because if the culture in the country is that of blatant, blatant looting, there is a breakdown now in the culture of the country and, and it, 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 invariably it will affect other aspects of the country as well. We want our country back. Guys, we want our country back. That's the message we want to give. And therefore everybody must take responsibility now to put our country back on track. We can no longer afford to allow our states to be captured like this and looted like this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nirupa, um, Nunku Lega takes us to the culture question and whistleblowing. Uh, I promise I wouldn't ask you a very political question, but uh, beyond VBS, uh, there's also SAA. Uh, and I'm honing in on SAA because I'm reading her book, Cynthia Stimple. Uh, she was the former group treasurer at SAA. Uh, she tipped off the National Treasury about a, a dodgy deal that would cost SAA a lot of money. But in whistleblowing, she was hounded out, uh, and that is the narrative and the script uh, in South Africa when it comes to whistleblowing. Uh, legislation does not protect whistleblowers. Uh, in fact, whistleblowers are, are cast as the bad guys uh, for doing good. Uh, but how do we build a culture that supports and protects uh, whistleblowers uh, in your view, Naripa? So I think, you know, following on from Nongkululeko, where we're saying like, we really need our country back. We want our country back. So I think whistleblowers should be really encouraged where if they know something that they protect it, okay? 
And I think in my view, as Nomkululeku said, it's Urba that can play quite an important role in terms of holding their members accountable. I think the because the punishment is so small that people just think it's okay to go on. And because there's nothing in it for the whistleblower. And if I can add a slight philosophical twist to this, Ray, it's really about, in today's times, it's become more difficult to do the right thing. So if I get a cheating student, there's certain things I can do, there's certain things I can punish, but there's certain things you need to work within the rules. You need to try and really maneuver to hold the person accountable. So in the same way with the country, I think that if we can get something more in place for whistleblowers to be protected, to feel comfortable, to be able to go out there and say, this is what I found, this is what should happen. And I actually think a lot of the trainee accountants potentially pick up a lot of stuff. I can almost say to you quite comfortably that I draw good people from practice to come to academia. And the question is why? Yes, they may love teaching for sure, but it's because they don't want to be in this vibe all the time where there's things happening and they, they need to be quiet. And I think that culture shift in the profession has to happen where people have to do the right thing. If they do the right thing, they are commended. And if they do the wrong thing, I, in my view, we need like a few bold examples of you did the wrong thing, you out. You did the wrong thing, you out. Like real, you know, examples of saying, if anyone does this, I mean, it's something I try to implement in my school. If you're going to cheat, we're going to take you to legal. We're going to do our best to get you out the system. So that must be like an example that if you're going to do the wrong thing, you will be accountable. Thanks, Ray. Mm. Michael, I just want to pick up on that point. Um, and you referred to the VBS case uh, where a junior audit, uh, audit, uh, auditing professional um, informed uh, you know, his senior that there were problems with uh, VBS accounts, but the senior and lead audit partner uh, at KPMG was receiving bribes uh, to look the other way and uh, ignore the red flags. Um, how do we build that culture of whistleblowing? Because I can tell you, if I was a CA at an organization and my boss was Nunguleg, for example, I could never challenge her. I could never have the, 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 the bravery and gumption to challenge uh, at all because she's senior, she's more formidable uh, than I am. So, uh, so how do we get there to, to building that culture of protecting whistleblowers? I think it's a big challenge, but I, I do think what we need to try and do is separate out the issues of legal protection for whistleblowers outside of their institutions, uh, for those who are forced to leave the confines of the company or the institution that they find themselves in to blow the whistle. Um, and then the actual processes and procedures within the firms. I think that there's a limited amount of influence and control we can have on the way the big four amend their, their processes. But I do think that, um, you know, as Nurupa said, the, the best remedy is accountability. And so, for example, I think that the VBS case is an instructive example, is that should the system not be set up to allow for punitive measures against KPMG to say it was a systemic failure. The fact that you, as one of the largest audit firms in the world, could not set up a system of control to identify the fact that this was going wrong, despite the fact that your own auditors saw the problems, uh, that should respond, uh, result in some kind of liability for you. And it's not enough for you to push the registered auditor away and said, well, that, that was a bad apple. Um, I think that's one way in which we could help uh, help address the problem. Because I think greater consequences for the firm itself is the only way you're going to shift that discussion uh, internally about setting up processes to protect people. And then I think the... The, the second point is really much more about uh, new legislation that might be needed to, to properly protect whistleblowers uh, on a much wider level. And I, I do certainly hope that the recommendations of the Zondo Commission are going to be very strong on this issue. I know that several organizations have made submissions 
to Zondo on this matter. Uh, and I certainly hope that there'll be something in there that, that we as the public and civil society can take forward um, f- from the perspective of protecting whistleblowers. Mm. Nunculega, I'm going to abuse you here, um, given your position, your previous position at Urba. Uh, a lot of people are asking us about, does Urba have the capacity uh, to regulate and are they properly regulating the audit profession? <laughs> well, um, I mean, um, remember, we, 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 we have an ERPA that, you know, an auditing profession that is number one in the world and, and so on and so forth. I mean, obviously, there may have been some complacency here uh, around we, we are the best in the world and all of that. But since the, the, the breakdown uh, and the scandals that we have seen, no one uh, can now you know, hide and say uh, they, they, they have the capacity and, and everything else, which is why it is important to look at these institutions that are regulating accountants and, and auditors. And, and I'm glad that we're raising the issue of internal auditors because for me, internal auditors are really key in this because they are there right through the year. And they are the ones who can pick up those red flags earlier than, than anybody else. So we need to strengthen all of these institutions, uh, including the, 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 the internal auditors. So ERPA you know, is, is on a journey. Uh, we, we, we reviewed their strategy uh, this year and we actually emphasize the fact that they, they need to strengthen themselves to be able to be a better regulator and to be a better watchdog. And, and of course, the, the, the amended Audit Act also has given them motive. But again, ERPA alone will not, is not going to be able to do this. For me, there is no excuse for auditing firms not to make sure that they've got the, the right culture in the organization. I mean, there's no excuse f- for them. I understand the broader institutions. I mean, whistleblowers are killed in South Africa, physically killed. So if you know that you might even die, you, you, you are not going to be able to, to come up to, uh, and say these things. So we need to fix the country, but for auditors themselves, for me, there's no excuse. They have to clean up their act, and 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 yes, they must face the music when uh, when we see these failures. Thanks, mm. Nirupa. I'm also going to pick on you uh, because you're also part of Urba. Um, it, you know, Michael told us earlier on that Urba can impose uh, a maximum charge of about two hundred thousand rand, uh, you know, per transgression. Um, so this seems like it's a slap on the wrist kind of uh, sanction. What would be the alternative, you think, um, you know, to, to, to deter any bad behavior in the industry? Yeah, so I wanna first just mention that, yes, I was in Urba for a very short six months, and I think I was really ruffling a lot of feathers there. I got thrown out. <laughs> So, <laughs> and then they sent Nam Kululeko in to, to try and be the caretaker for a short time. So, um, what I can say is that when it comes to the punishment, certainly uh, the powers of Urba, are, the, the punishment is not great. And it really is a slap in the wrist. And another point, Ray, is that the audit firms are also in short. So when these things happen, the insurance can cover this so easily. So I think, you know, a financial implication, um, I would propose something like a percentage of whatever. So, you know, if it's 50% of whatever that damage was or something is your punishment. Uh, I think if, if it's like really punitive, uh, people will be scared. Whereas if it's 100 or 200 they, they really don't mind the, the punishment. And I think certainly, um, you know, the imprisonment and things like that, I think anyone is scared to go to jail, you know. And I think if those things are done and people are held accountable, and like I said earlier, you need a few ripe examples and the rest will settle itself very quickly. 
So I think that it's time for us where we are there. So, I mean, all of us can, can talk till we blew in the face, but unless actually the profession takes the bull by its horns and say, we want our profession back, you know? And if I may, Ray, link to the, the, the a separate point that if I may just add on, is for me, the other big thing is about regaining trust. You know, we've just lost trust. How, what, what can we do to really get trust back from the public to say, actually, we can rely on auditors to do the right thing and to alert us if there is something going on. For me, in my own mind, I'm also thinking, you know, and yes, it's Urba's role, but Urba themselves are not going to manage to achieve it unless we all, you know, join hands with this. Mm. Michael, uh, we, we, we briefly touched on the independence of, um, you know, audit firms and someone asks in the comment section, uh, does mandatory audit firm rotation not address the challenge um, of independence uh, uh, significantly? Because, you know, there is a concern that audit firms are too close to their clients. Uh, for example, uh, at Deloitte, uh, you know, Deloitte was Tonga Hewlett's uh, auditor for about 80 years. Uh, surely this has contributed to governance problems uh, that we've seen and auditors not having enough skeptical mindsets. It was definitely a significant problem. Um, and I think it was also a great irony uh, of these kind of hundred year relationships um, is that it really belied the whole notion that the auditor was the last person to arrive because actually the auditor in many cases had been there for so long, so many years, they were deeply embedded um, and they certainly didn't want to leave because it was very lucrative. And I, I think that that's, that conflict of interest was so systemic. And I, I, what I would say is that the, the mandatory rotation is necessary, but not enough. I think it's a very important step. Um, and I think that by breaking that cycle, uh, it, it goes a long way towards addressing the problem. However, I think there remains a much more deep-seated issue um, or two deep-seated issues. The one is this, this issue of multifaceted firms doing consulting, advisory, tax advice, auditing, um, and being able to, you know, often being forward looking, you might not be the auditor in the future, but you might be looking towards other lucrative advisory work in the future. That's an issue. Um, but the second issue is that there remain conflict of interest just in terms of the rotation of people and the revolving door between boards firms and regulators. So if you looked, I think, I can't remember the exact figure, but the, you know, the top 40 on the JSE, almost all of the chiefs of their um, audit committees on the board came from old big four firms, many of whom used to be the auditor at the firm. Um, and then, of course, many of those people eventually will find their way into the regulatory board if there's not sufficient independence. And that's an issue around the world. And I think, you know, you have to be able to tackle those uncomfortable questions about conflict of interest at the same time. And you need to add protections there to mandatory rotation in order to really get to the heart of, of some of those independence issues. Mm. Uh, Nankulaga, you are being challenged uh, in the comments section. Uh, someone says, I totally disagree with uh, Ms. Gobodo. Uh, the auditors are expected to exercise due care and be independent and exercise the utmost professionalism. Um, how do you respond to that? I don't remember when I said uh, they, 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 they are not. I mean, I mean, obviously, the first thing that we had taught at Varsity was independence. I mean, they used to say that you, you you must not just be independent you must be seen to be to be independent and 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 where we have failed around this issue of independence is really this this profit motive i mean when we are chasing riches you are going to turn a blind eye to 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 certain things and and auditors are well trained i agree with this you know auditors are well trained people uh, Psycho programs are, are, are excellent. Of course, they can be, they can be improved. But 
this thing is about values, guys. It, it is about your own values now as a person. I just cannot imagine a professional who would turn a blind eye to fraudulent activities at an at, at a, a entity where they are auditing. I really, for me, that thing is really just mind blowing that people would actually, professionals would actually do that. But if we all, I mean, when I was a, a, I didn't go into the profession to chase riches. I knew that that's not where you find riches. But nowadays, you know, we want the holiday home, we want the five cars, like everybody else, unfortunately, it's the whole issue of greed that was suffering in the world. Mm. So we have about uh, nine minutes left, uh, you know, uh, during this discussion. We did set uh, 6.30 as the time to go away. Uh, so I need to bliss through um, the questions. Um, maybe for you a question, uh, Nurupa. Someone says we need to clarify who are regarded as auditors. Are chartered accountants who are not registered with URBA um, auditors? Uh, that's what the, the person asks. Uh, do you want to take that? No. So a chartered accountant is first registered with SICA, which is four years of varsity training, three years of firm traineeship and the two board exams that makes them a chartered accountant. To be an auditor, you need to re be registered with ERBA and meet their requirements where you can then actually sign off on financials. And I think there's also a question on the chat where it says, uh, you know, and Nomkululeko also raised that, that there's many CAs, but are not necessarily auditors. So they're not regulated by ERBA, but they are regulated by SICA. So I mm. hope that clarifies that. Perfect. Michael, uh, is there a correlation between audit fees and the quality of the audit? That's a question. Do you want to take that? I, d I don't have a straight answer for that. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But what I would say I think is, is fairly unambiguous, and Nonkululeko has kept returning to this, is that we see where there are very juicy and lucrative fees. We often see audit error and audit failure. Um, and I think that, that it is one of the issues that the, um, the more lucrative it becomes, both on the audit side, but especially on those alternative services side, that that can have an impact on audit quality because it, it does raise those possible conflicts. Mm. So I want to can spend I add, the... Can I add in this thing of sure. fees? You know, sure. this, this whole issue of fees is actually quite complex because mm. audit, um, audit committees really have to play their role of, of, of um, an, an oversight role around this thing of fees because there's competition among these firms, right? So, so there, there is a tendency of you know, cutting fees so that you can get to the opportunity uh, of the job. And, and, and so, and, and sometimes management also squeezes these firms around the, the whole issue of, of fees. So, so, um, so the, there might be a, a tendency of cutting corners because you have a tight budget, because you undercoated, because you wanted to, to see the job. So it's not just a question of it's lucrative and blah, blah, blah. Guys, I mean, you, audit firms are appointing highly qualified, expensive people. So these audits are expensive because of that. But let's make sure that they don't cut the fees and then end up cutting corners because they want to win the job or they want to succumb to management who's putting pressure on them uh, around the fees. Thanks. Mm. Michael, I want to go back to you, and there's something I really want to address before we go away. Uh, isn't there a problem when it comes to transparency by auditing firms? Uh, there's currently no requirement for uh, firms uh, to publicly disclose their clients, uh, you know, and if, you know, uh, audit partners have personal relationships with their, relationships with their clients. Uh, we don't know the financial books of auditing firms, um, but on the JSC, uh, you know, this, there's a high level of disclosure, but there isn't, you know, at, at an auditing level. So isn't transparency here a problem also? I, I would agree wholeheartedly. And I think that there's a, a very interesting um, comparison here between law firms and, and audit firms is that both of these industries have grown from a model of, as we said earlier, being smaller professional-based partnerships. Um, but rather what we have now are these 
global mega corporations that are some of the most powerful entities in the world and yet are not abiding by the same kind of rules that public companies have to abide by in many cases, um, as well as all of the implications um, for, I suppose, the control that partners have in the firm and some of the incentives that that means for uh, for junior auditors. So I, mean, I certainly think that it's something that needs to be addressed and it needs to go hand in hand with, with this issue that we actually started with which is we need to reassess our understanding of these professions in the sense that they are professions that now coexist within these absolutely massive uh, mega corporations. And that has fundamentally, I think, changed the way that they engage and the way that they do their work. And, mm. and the, as you say, the, the transparency issues, the, the opacity in the way that they operate, the closed doors, that's a, it's a perfect example of why it's, it's a problem. I want to spend the last few minutes of this discussion uh, looking forward. We've talked about the past. We've talked about, you know, auditing firms need to come clean. There's a challenge for you, the industry, uh, come clean, open up. Um, I want to talk about if you could pick two reform measures that we need to focus on going forward to fix the auditing profession. What would be those two reform measures? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Nirupa. Uh, thanks, Ray. I'm going to agree with the last point on the chat. Let's make accounting and auditing boring again. So I think uh, that's a very useful thing, which we actually started off with, you know. So I think for me, the two things would be where Urba needs to have more teeth and enforce it. And they would need resources to do this. Because while I was there, one of the issues is they don't, they're not well resourced. And the timelines are just too long. So there needs to be quick action and punitive action. I think that's the one quick reform. And I think the second thing is about um, the correct behavior, ethical behavior needs to stem from leadership. And I think if leaders, be it in the country, be it in the law firms, the banks, the auditing profession, leaders at large that really take the ethical stance, I think that's what's really needed as, as a full country at the moment. Thanks. Nankuriloko, your two reform uh, proposals. I mean, obviously we, we want to strengthen uh, the, the ERBA. I mean, uh, you know, we're saying that there's no transparency uh, and everything else, but the ERPA actually conducts annual inspections of these auditing firms. And I think that process has to be strengthened. They need to modernize, they need to digitize, and they need to keep, you know, in line with the progress because this, these firms are always innovating. Uh, and the app, I, you know, have to be strengthened around the, 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 this innovation also, so that those uh, inspections um, uh, are more competent, if, if you like. But also, I think the app I must find a way of holding not just the, the registered auditor accountable, but the auditing firm as well, uh, more accountable. Because I think there's just an emphasis on me as an individual, if the firm can sacrifice me, they'll get another auditor tomorrow. But if the accountability is held, uh, is, is the firm itself is held accountable for these failures, we'll see them, you know, getting their eggs together very quickly. Mm -hmm. The last point I want to make is the, the accounting profession itself has become very complex. So auditors have to comply with these thousands of accounting standards, and it's taking so much of their attention that they're not paying enough attention on all these other um, fraudulent things that are happening. So we need to find a way of simplifying the profession. Thanks. And Michael, you have the last word, your two reform picks. So the one of them is to definitely reiterate actually the point that's come before is that I think effective sanction, proper punitive sanction for firm and auditor with a monetary 
fine. That is actually a deterrent. But I also think what would be really powerful would be to see a couple of example prosecutions where that conduct has amounted to criminal conduct. And there are certain provisions within the Act, uh, the Order Profession Act, which are criminal. Um, and I think that that would send a message that these things are really kind of being examined and that would be powerful. And then the second thing is that I think we need to, and this is the public civil society and the industry is that we need to have a proper debate around the structural changes that need to happen within the big four. And I return to this issue of the possible full structural separation of auditing from consulting. And the last thing that I would say on that front is that we just need to be cautious that we cannot let the big four themselves dictate what the reform agenda will be, because our feeling is that they will always default to a position that protects what has become an incredibly profitable model for them. And we've seen it elsewhere in the world. Whenever we start talking about really powerful regulators and structural reforms, we see the big four raising the alarm, all sorts of warnings about the economy and how things are going to fall apart. But we sometimes need to see those for what they are, which is a, a knee-jerk reaction to protecting what is very lucrative for them. Um, and so I think those hard questions about structural changes also need to be, to, to be had. Hmm. Well, that was such a... Lovely discussion all. Uh, Nirupa Padia, Michael Marchant, uh, Nankulila Gobodo, thank you so much uh, to each and every one of you for participating uh, in this discussion. I think we maybe we need uh, another discussion focusing exclusively on the big four and having them here to account for where they did not um, the way they have not disclosed information about their role in high-level corruption. Thank you so much to all the attendees. We had over 200 people joining us. Uh, and for the questions, thank you so much, uh, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Thanks That's so much, great. everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.